Hartelijk welkom allemaal. Um, a warm welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Juri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali and I will try to um, conduct this evening in a pleasant manner. Um, warm welcome to everybody at home as well. There are a lot of people watching at home. Um, you're here because um, uh, it's better to be here than to watch it from home because you know as a an audience that is better to be in each other's presence uh, than to watch it on a small screen because it's totally different if you re see the real person, the real man. And you're here because uh, you're here because we're talking to Ivan Krastev. A warm welcome to Ivan. Thank you. You're, um, it's not by no means the first time uh, you're here in the Bali. We have met many conversations um, before. Uh, you've um, written a chapter in a book we published four, five years ago by now. Rethinking Europe, Thoughts on Europe, Past, Present and Future, because of the Forum on European Culture, we will be doing the third one this year. But now you're here because of the light that failed. Um, how the West uh, won the Cold War uh, but lost the peace, um, the light that failed. It's a citation from, uh, actually, the same title um, by Roger Kipling, the book you mentioned just in the end of the book. So you nicked the title, actually, from Kipling which is interesting as well, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, it's a wonderful book, it's written with Stephen Holmes. Um, I'm gonna look that up. Stephen Holmes is um, a, a professor of law at New York University, receives his PhD from Yale, um, uh, joined the faculty at Princeton University in 1997, a professor of politics, and now he's a professor of law. Um, but Ivan Krastev, um, we're talking to now, um, is, uh, I don't think you need much introduction, but uh, just to be sure, fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna at the moment, chairman of the Center for Liberal St Strategies in Sofia. Um, you were born in Bulgaria and uh, still a citizen of Bulgaria, uh, living in Vienna at the moment, founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Crisis Group and contributing opinion editor, uh, writer to the New York Times and the Guardian, among many others. But um, uh, the Dutch translation is very, very good, actually. I started um, uh, with the English version. Um, uh, I have to recommend it, because then I continued in Dutch, because I thought might as well. Frans Reusink uh, uh, translated uh, it in Dutch, just came out. Um, and we, will, um, we asked um, um, Kirian Esser, um, because we have three fragments in between of the, the conversation, um, actor Kirian Esser to, to um, read out to us uh, three fragments we, we've chosen. Jante Mosselman, the editor of the Bali, and myself. Um, so we're going to conduct a conversation mainly on liberalism, I would say. Um, the light that failed, that's probably the light of the enlightenment that failed, the light of the liberal democracies, the rule of law, democracy, the liberal democracy that failed, the light to the nations maybe. Um, and it failed, um, of course, not after 89 immediately, it failed sort of a long decline over the past decades and suddenly we're in this situation in where liberalism is no longer the real uh, a light to the nations and the only solution to our problems, the only way to rule our countries. It suddenly we are surrounded um, by many illiberal states and by many illiberal parties among our states. And I think the book is extremely well written, pointing out you know, how from 1989 till this moment, where we came from, how this has happened, and what happened. Um, we're gonna try to shed some light on that. <laughs> and um, um, I just wanna I just want to start out maybe with a broad question to give you the possibility to sketch a little bit what you've been trying to achieve with the book. Um, and then I have many questions, and at the end I will ask you to join in with questions. Um, according to you, is, it, is this a book teaching liberals? Is this, a book, is this book about liberalism? Or what, what did you try to really convey with the book, Ivan Kastov? Thank you very much. Uh, we used to have in school, uh, in Bulgaria, this famous what the author wanted to say. Uh, and normally you should never ask the author, because uh, he's probably much unaware. But first, thank you very much for the opportunity, and it's a great pleasure. And, uh, Yuri is a very old friend of mine. I'm very also grateful to the translator and to the publishers, because to be honest, if you, 
if you decide to like the book, it could be much more because of the translator than of us, because <laughs> in a certain way. And also, you're missing a lot that Stephen Holmes is not here, but uh, uh, with, he's really an extremely interesting person. But here's the story. I don't know how we're teaching or not teaching anything. Like many probably in this room, we're trying to ask ourselves what happened, why it is happening, and also why we were not prepared, why we have been so much surprised. And with Stephen, we have a different history, but we have been uh, talking to each other for a long time. He was one of these um, star American constitutional lawyers who in the early 1990s, 1991, uh, they have this uh, constitutional project in the Chicago University that was ghostwriting the constitution of East European countries. East Europeans basically were very much interested uh, to get the advice, American Constitutions was doing so well. And you have some of these really big names, Jon Elster and others, that had a special project trying to help East Europeans to write better constitutions. And when we met in the mid-1990s, it came from the fact that I was trying slightly to ridicule something that they have written. And basically, being a constitutional lawyers, they were reading our constitutions and all the time saying, oh, this was borrowed from here or borrowed from there. And in the Bulgarian constitution, there is the following article that only people who are older than 40, being born in Bulgaria and living in the country for the last five years have the right to run for president. And in their project, they said this was borrowed, probably I don't remember from which constitution. And I told him this was borrowed from nowhere. Simply, there were three persons that we didn't want to run. So everything was done to stop these three persons. One was the former king, who had not left in, lived in the country for the five years. The other was one of the leaders of the Socialist Saxon, Party, Saxon yeah, Gota, who was huh? born in Moscow. Uh, and the third was one of the very kind of, this moment, popular trade union leader, who was younger than 40. So the story is, when you look from outside, you're always trying to see a kind of a big principle, when you go closer, you're going to see a lot of local politicking. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because now when we started talking with him, we were very much triggered by the question that Obama asked in the day when he was leaving the White House. So he's living these days, the new president is coming, and according to the memoirs of his advisor, Ben Rhodes, uh, Obama said, what if we were wrong? He didn't say what we did wrong. He didn't ask who did wrong. <laughs> this is not Hillary, what happened. Uh, <laughs> it was what if we were wrong. And the question that we were interested in is, what if we got wrong the meaning of the post-Cold War decades? And then we started with uh, Frank Fukuyama, and we decided to reread a lot of the stuff that had been written immediately after the end of the Cold War. And here are just two things that are going to be interesting for you who didn't waste your time doing this. After the end of the Cold War, triumphalism was not the sentiment. Uncertainty and fear was the sentiment. If you go to see the first big books being published in the early 1990s, it was New World Disorder, was one of the titles, Zbigniew Brzezinski published Out of Order. Something very unexpected has happened. And people were happy that it did happen, but they didn't know exactly what was happening. Uh, triumphalism came much later. And then we said, okay, what exactly? What Fukuyama said? Why now everybody is ridiculing him? Was there something that basically he got right and he got wrong? And we went back, and this is interesting, it, imagine, it's April 1989. Soviet Union is still there, and nobody's expected it to collapse. Keep in mind, in the December 1990, the panel of the top American specialists on Soviet Union declared that the chance for the disintegration of the Soviet Union was under 30%. December 1990. While well, this was written in April 1989, there was no Tiananmen, there was nothing. This, you mean, Fuku uh, I mean Fukuyama's, Fukuyama's article? Yeah. Yeah. And he said the end of history has arrived. 
So his major story was not that Soviet Union is going to disintegrate or China is going to make this and that. His major argument was Cold War was about the clash of two big ideologies, all of them rooted in the European Enlightenment. All of them have been universalists, and all of them claim that the future belongs to them. The Western democratic Western li liberalism liberal on and one side Eastern and Soviet communism on the other. Both children of the Enlightenment. Both of them were children yeah. in the Enlightenment. Yeah. And the idea was who was the legitimate one. <laughs> and then one of them basically said, we're out. One we of them out. just collapsed. Yeah, yeah the, the, it, was not, it was not about victory. It was basically we're out. It was Gorbachev, it was the Chinese, uh, and then of course the countries went in a different direction, but basically they said our view of the future, our claim that we are going to transform the world is not there anymore. And what happened is, and this is why we, uh, we were so much attracted by this, suddenly you have these two visions, and because of the, these visions clashing, people were over there taking sides, they're making choices, or they decide not to make choice. Sovereignty for some of the third world countries was which side they're going to take, but because they're making a choice, they have the feeling that they have power. And then suddenly, there is only one vision, and this was the vision of the democratic capitalism. Uh, and then, Democratic capitalism simply became the synonymous with modernity. In order to be modern was to live like the West, to have Western institutions, to elect your leaders, to have a market economy. So suddenly it was not a contested anymore. And in a certain way, I do believe Fukuyama got it right. And just to tell you what in our view he got wrong and all this book is about. So he got it right that it was a major disruption. By the way, Fukuyama is not a naive person who believes that everybody is going to become like the United States. And by the way, he never claimed that the end of history is a very exciting place. Just the opposite, he said it's very boring, it's uh, awful, in fact, I don't want to live there much. Uh, uh, but basically, he said ideological confrontation is over. There are going to be political conflicts, there are going even to be probably a movement of rage, but none of these people are going to afford any vision of the world which is going to be on the level of the liberal democracy. And then we said what it means that everybody is going to agree and to be like the West. It means that everybody is going to imitate the West. And being East European, I remember very well that in 1990, 1991, the key word in our part of the world was normality. We want to be normal. We want to be normal people living in a normal country, and it means living like in the West. And imitation, by the way, is part of human history all the time, so there is nothing new about this. Uh, the new was three things, and this is what is this book about. When we have been reading Fukuyama, Fukuyama believes that, of course, it's going to be slightly boring, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be without conflicts, but it, conflicts are never going to matter much. But he didn't understand how antagonistic is the world which is divided between the models and the copies between the ones that are going to be imitated and others who are going to imitate them. And there was another guy who basically got it much earlier, how imitation, how antagonistic things imitation is. And this is the French philosopher René Girard. Girard was totally obsessed with the problem of mimesis. And it was him who said, listen, be careful. The most important about imitation is imitation of desires. People want something because other people want it. For example, if you have a room full of toys, and there is a girl who had a toy in her hands, when you invite another girl and said, what kind of toy do you want? She's going to ask for the toy in the heads of the other girl. Not and all the other things laying not around. Not all the other things there. One in, in order somebody uh, basically uh, to be desired, somebody else should desire it. And as a result of it... So you imitate the desires of the others. Imitated other. desire of the others is what is strictly about. So then we start to think very much about where then this resentment came. Why you have these governments in Hungary and Poland, all of us wanting to be like the West. Where this resentment to the West came from? Because people are going to explain everything with the economy. But listen, 2008 and 2009 explain many things that happened in some of the countries. But believe me, they don't explain much about Poland. 
Poland. Yeah, because in the last 30 years, Poland's GDP tripled. They didn't have a recession after 1992. Even the social inequality has declined in the last 10 years. More than 70% of the Poles today were saying that basically they are very satisfied with their personal lives. If this is the case, where the anger comes from? And of course you have economic losers, and of course you have many other things that people disagree, but the intensity of the anger cannot be explained simply through the macroeconomic story. And when people are telling me, oh, but this is the return to the way the East Europeans have ever been, this idea of the backsliding. By the is way, this idea that Eastern and Central Europeans are, are, are specifically, specifically authoritarian? Yeah, mm -hmm. and basically uh, uh, the backsliding of democracy. By the way, backsliding is a religious term which was coined during the days of the Spanish Inquisition. And backsliding is when a baptized Jew goes back to his old bad habits. So it's very interesting because the people who talk about backsliding, they very much perceive democracy as a conversion. A conversion uh, <laughs> to an idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So to I'm believe. saying this, and then we started very much to be interested on this story about imitation. And we claim the following. People always imitate. We are going always to imitate. Uh, there was a sociologist from the 19th century, French, uh, Tardet, who said, imitation is the other name for society. But there was four specific characteristics in the way the East was imitating the West after the end of the Cold War. First, we're imitating the whole model. And from this point of view, European integration is the most classical example of this. You're basically taking the legislation, the institutions of somebody else. Psychologically, imitating is not easy. If I want to be like you, it means that I recognize that you're better than me. I want to change myself to become like you. Secondly, I'm imitating you, but you are changing all the time. Imagine the West in 1989. And I'm always saying, see the West in 1989 through the eyes of a Polish peasant living outside of the big cities, what was so attractive to him to the West? Okay, one was consumption and private property, but the other was the communists didn't believe in God. The West believed in God. Communists were kind of a sexually permissive. Well, you have a traditional family, which he imagined is basically. So communists were internationalists. In the West, they basically praised the nation. And then imagine this same kind of a peasant 30 years later, where he understood that the West is not particularly about God. Uh, traditional family values is not something that is driving Western societies, because Western societies have been changing for the last 30 years, and you cannot blame them for doing this. This was basically how societies developed. So suddenly you have the, what was that we're imitating. It's and gone. some of the conservative uh, groups in our society the idea that we are imitating something different, that we have been promised, is very strong. And this comes the idea we are the real thing. The second thing that happened about imitation is it's not simply that you are imitating, but you are imitating in front of the eyes of the model. So I try to be a liberal, and then the Dutch liberal comes and said, listen, you are succeeding to 67%. There are certain things that you basically should shape. And in the beginning, you're happy that you're doing better than 50. Uh, uh, but, then, but then you start to say that this relations is very asymmetrical to when I'm going to be lectured. And this idea that I don't want to be lectured all the time, I'm against this asymmetry, is becoming very strong. And some of these populist leaders managed to mobilize a lot of support just on the base of the fact we are not students, we are not going to be lectured all the time. And the third thing that is, uh, 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 in my view, very important about this imitation model is, even if you're doing fine, if your model gets a crisis, you have the feeling of crisis. Even if your economy is doing okay, if the European and American economies after 2008, 2009 went in crisis, you're asking what you're doing. This, by the way, is very well studied on the example of people who are always late for the railway station, and they get their train in the last three minutes before the train departs. After 10 minutes, most of these people start to have a hysteria. Are they on the right train? 
Uh, and this is a typical for the latecomers, <laughs> uh, because you're running so much, you so much wanted to be there, and then suddenly you have the feeling, am I on the right train? Was it not that when you joined the West, there are no crises anymore? Why? And of course, uh, this is critically important, because during the Cold War, Part of the legitimacy of the West was coming on the time that you're all the time comparing with something which exists in the real world. You see yourself, you see the Soviets, and you can talk. And you can say, you can do this in the West, and you cannot do this in the Soviet Union. So now, you're not comparing with anybody else. You're comparing with the ideal of the people what liberal democracy is about. And I'm going to end on this because one of the paradoxical effects of the end of the Cold War was the Western illusion that the end of the Cold War meant that the others are going to change, but the West is going to remain the same. And this was impossible. If others are changing, the West was going to change too. And suddenly, this is why everybody was surprised. And even more, because of the fact that everybody was imitating the West, the West lost a critical perspective towards the dysfunctionalities and failures of its own regime. Listen, if everybody wants to be like you, you should be fine. <laughs> you should be perfect. So as a result of the end of the Cold War, it's not simply that East fell in love with the West, but the West fell in love with itself. Uh, uh, and I do believe this is a story which basically explains, and this is why I want to end here, why so many people were shocked. And when basically Obama asked, I don't know what he meant when he said, what if we were wrong? This was about what we got wrong about the nature of our time. What we got wrong about how the world has changed after the, the end of the Cold War. It's I amazing. hope I was not very long. No, 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 I asked you But to this give is the problem with the small I, countries. I, you I, cannot I, stop us speaking. I, I. <laughs> We are a small country as well, but, <laughs> but um, I ask you to give a broader uh, expose of, and um, you're going into um, uh, many aspects of the book. It's amazing how you managed to, uh, uh, in this short expose, come to the last, almost the last page, where, um, uh, where you um, uh, say that in the end of the book, you're explaining that one of the big problems of the fact that there was no opponent anymore um, is that the West started to believe in itself and have no ways of correcting itself yeah. because there was no um, uh, uh, opponent left. Um, but um, uh, a few things. Um, you're saying that this imitation brought resentment, and you give many reasons for that, um, for that mechanism. Some of them uh, you illustrate with the girl and the other girl and the, the two toys, uh, or, or with um, uh, admitting that you're less good than the other one by imitating it. And, um, but in the end, um, if, um, and, and you're also saying, um, among many other things, but that Fukuyama's right, that the end of history was there because there was no longer liberalism and communism or Marxism and, 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 and liberal uh, democracy, um, the two children of the Enlightenment, of the French Revolution, but both went away, both were over. And in a way, um, just, I mean, you explained it very well in the book, but not in your speech just now, <laughs> um, because um, first, if you're imitated all over the world, you're successful. You're not over. You're the model. You're functioning. You're, I mean, you, you ought to be happy. Um, you're not gone. And you said, well, only the only thing which is left is market capitalism, which is a total different thing than liberal democracy, yeah. of course. And we need to remember that. That's a yeah. very important um, uh, a notion. But. Um, um, because of this imitation, liberalism went away, or what's, you know, no, what's the... Liberalism is not going away, but liberalism leads, lo lost its hegemonic position. And this mm -hmm. is, by the way, liberalism and communism did not live in the same time. Communism was abandoned by its own supporters. So listen, this is over. Uh, uh, in China, you have a communist party, but there is no communist ideal which they want to do. The, basically, the, this is not the purpose of the Chinese Communist Party to build communism. Yeah, so it was left, uh, so its believers this, left it. In a certain yeah. way, uh, and this is, by the way, this was interesting when you compare China and Soviet Union. Late 1980s, in both societies, on the level of the communist elites, they have agreed 
of communism does not work. But see how different lessons they got out of it. The Soviets decided that what was good about communism was the socialist ideas and what was bad was the monopoly of the Communist Party. So Gorbachev basically dis decided to reform the Soviet Union on this model. In China, they took just the opposite lesson. What is good about communism is the monopoly of the Communist Party. And what was not good basically was the communist ideology. Uh, because the Communist Party you can do is their monopoly what you want. This was an effective power. I'm saying this because this is not the story that liberalism is going to disappear. And by the way, this is not a pessimistic book. Uh, I, I don't like this, uh, this optimism, pessimism story. We have a good, by the way, joke about this in Bulgaria. And the joke is uh, a foreign correspondent goes to Sofia and said, or, and with all these problems, you're probably a pessimist. And the taxi driver told him, no, no, I'm an optimist. The pessimists have already left the country. Uh, 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 but it's not about <laughs> optimism or pessimism. This book has the title, The Light That Failed, for a very specific reason. When Kipling wrote this first novel of his, this is about blindness, love and blindness in a certain way, uh, his mother, who was a serious person, like my mother, told him that she wants a thin book with a happy end. And because he was a good son, he wrote one version which was much shorter and with happy end. But then this was, he was not totally convinced, so he also published the same book as a longer book with an unhappy end. Listen, even our Dutch publisher was not going to allow us to go with two different versions one optimistic, the other pessimistic. So then we decided to, to borrow the title, telling people, listen, you can read it as you want. If you want to be pessimistic, we cannot stop you. Uh, but our story is liberalism is going to be around because there are certain things about liberalism that are always going to appeal uh, to the human nature, the idea that people basically have rights, that power should be constrained. This is not things that are disappearing because of this and that. But the idea that this is going to be the only model that everybody is going to imitate, we don't believe that is here anymore. And even uh, what is more important, in the West itself, we're going to ask the question exactly how the liberal society is going to look like. So from this point of view, for us, this was the major message. We live, I do believe we live in the world uh, in which communism is not an option anymore. Liberalism is going to be one of the major options, but there are going to be others. Or as uh, Ken Jowett, one of uh, uh, famous American uh, political science professor and a friend of both Stephen and me, he had this beautiful uh, metaphor that only in Netherlands you're going to understand rightly because of the nature of the Dutch society. He said, as a rule, history is Protestant. There are different forms coexisting, but they are Catholic moments. <laughs> in which uh, a certain type of institutions is universally followed by everybody. So from this point of view, 1989 was a Catholic moment. Everybody wanted to imitate the West, to be like the West, to try to adopt. This was the only success visible. And then the world went, went Protestant again. Which means divergence. Which means that there are yeah. going to be divergence, you're going to have a different views, and when it comes to the level of capitalism, Branko Milanovic has a recent book in which he made a point which I found very interesting. He said, capitalism has won globally, but now the clash between different forms of capitalism, particularly Chinese state capitalism and the Western more liberal capitalism, is going to be even more intense than the previous wars in the way the inter-religious wars Catholics versus Protestants or Sunni versus Shia gave quite often much more kind of a victims than basically the normal civilization clashes. And I do believe this is important and for us it was very important also to try to go to this story and to try to understand exactly what has failed, what has changed. Because other, either people believe that we're going to be back, for example, people believe it's enough Donald Trump not to be elected, and I don't know what should have happened in Britain, probably to return back to the European Union. And then the world is going to be back where it was. It will never go back where it was. Nevertheless, who is going to be elected American president? Nevertheless, what the next British government is going to be? It's going to be a different world. By the way, it could be much better. 
And also we never understood why a big part of our societies were not so happy as us with the way it was. And from this point of view, Central and East European story is an interesting story because in the book, uh, one of the things that, uh, and this was important also for me for my previous book, is that there are many things that we don't see when we just talk about institutions. For example, we, we cannot understand why an old Bulgarian lady is unhappy not simply because her pension is small, but because her kids has left. And do you know what is most difficult for her? On one level, she's happy that the kids has left. Because they're happier. They have a better education, they live in Amsterdam, they're making good money and they enjoy their life. On the other side, she's missing them. And this kind of ambiguity of success was something very much missed. We believe that GDP, for example, increase was enough to make society better, no. it is not. No. On the other side, does it mean that transition in Central and Eastern Europe has failed? It is not true. Central and Eastern Europe is really transformed in a big way. Uh, if you go to places like the big cities, Prague or Bratislava and so on, you're going to be amazed how much they have been trans changed. I know my own country, but I remember Poland, Warsaw in 1990. It was just a devastating place. It was gray. You have all these people around. The old system was not there. The new system has not arrived. People basically are just kind of a, I don't know, do you know this feeling when people walk around because they don't know what to do? And then you go to Poland and you're going to be shocked. In Warsaw, people are not walking, they're running. Uh, the level of energy that the city really radiates is amazing. Uh, and I do believe how to tell the story, because if somebody wants to tell the story of the crisis of liberalism, he should be able to tell two stories at the same time. Why it worked for a while, while it became a crisis, and thirdly, why it can become a crisis without any alternative being there. Because China, on a global level, people can say that it's an alternative. Probably it is an alternative for the African countries for the developing countries in general. I had not seen any Bulgarian. Nevertheless, how critical he or she could be towards the liberal model in which we live that wants very much to live in a Chinese model. And this goes even stronger about Russia. Uh, I know many Bulgarians, 70% of them, we highly respect President Putin, uh, but basically, it's one thing to say that Putin is a good Russian leader. It's totally different to say, I want to live in Putin's Russia. Uh, and, and this is an interesting story. For example, Bulgarians have a very high, highest in European Union uh, kind of uh, support for President Putin. At the same time, the Russian embassy didn't manage to find 1,500 Bulgarians to whom to give a fellowship to go to study in Russia. So this is the reality. If you're not going to get both things together, we're not understanding what is happening. Because both are true. Yeah, 70% believe we trust the Russian president. And then 1,500 people cannot get a fellowship, not to pay, to get a fellowship to go. So how are you reconciling this two? And this was what we would try to do with this book. And from this point of view, it's a book of a small insights, honestly speaking. We have this big imitation story. But at the end of the day, I do believe it was much more book based on in insights than on. But you sketching. Um one of the roots of the resentment we're seeing today in populist vote, in, anti, uh, in, in support for illiberal politicians, for Viktor Orban, Viktor Orban figures in the book quite often. Um, um, but then um, you're, trans you're, 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 you're um, bringing that conversation to America. You're saying, and that's very interesting, because um, the resentment Trump um, um, works with and, and, and feeds, his, uh, feeds his political power with, um, in a way um, is, at least that's what you're describing, that sounds very convincing. You're saying that um, um, the resentment from Central and Eastern Europe is that, you know, they're not the real one, they're imitating it and they're l being looked down upon, so they don't really, um, uh, they resent in the end sort of the liberal system, the international system. But then comes Trump along 
and he says, you know, the same thing. He says, you know, the international liberal order uh, is bad for America. You know, they've profited from us. We need to make America great again. So he's buying into that same story and is very successful with it, which is, which is amazing um, a turn in the book, I would say, because then suddenly, as a reader, you start to realize, hey, you know, um, if the Eastern Europeans don't, or the Central Europeans don't, abhor anymore to that international liberal system which was supposed to bring wealth and, uh, and well-being to everybody, um, if Trump is getting elected on the same story, what's happening here? So, um, do you think that he might be right that the international liberal system and the Bretton Woods agreements and those sort of things were profiting from America in a way that he I mean, America won the war, not only the Cold War, but also the Second World War. <laughs> and in the end, they, is that sort of story of anti-liberal, anti-internationalist anti story of Trump? Sure. No, listen, for us, this was the major challenge. We wanted to tell the story, and probably in some places we can over uh, done it's our It's a very framework. interesting term yeah. because you suddenly start to realize, yeah. hey, this Basically is Basically, we started, because you have an American, and of course he's very much preoccupied with what is happening in his country. You have an East European, and two of us have been doing Russia, and we said, okay, there is a resentment towards the age of imitation, but in these three places, there are three different resentments. In the Eastern Europe, it is the resentment of being a copy. We have this uh, beautiful quote in the beginning of the book by uh, eight, eight, 17th century, 18th century American poet who said, how it happened that we all are born originals and most of us die like a copies. Uh, this pressure to be original that comes from the cultural sphere and then basically the political imperative to imitate explains this European drama. And then you have Russia, and listen, Russia in the 1990s, to be honest, to a great extent, was also imitating simply because they had to survive. There was a country that basically was uh, lost, they lost territory, they lost basically the purpose, so imitating the Western institutions was also kind of their defense trying to find their place in the world. But then come the Russian president and he said, imitation can be also a weapon. I'm going to imitate the West and particularly the Western and American foreign policy in order to delegitimize the West. And basically this is what he's doing. Uh, Russia he's using a, the same like sort of... Russia is annexing way. Crimea and then they will go and the declaration on the annexation of Crimea borrows the whole paragraph of the NATO's declaration for the independence of Kosovo. Listen, Kosovo is not Crimea, and we, it's, it's not easy for us to argue why, but for him the major message is, we are not so different. And I, I'm always giving this example because I believe that it catches very much what he's doing. Suddenly after uh, the Russian special forces went to Crimea, a Russian president personally said there are no Russian special forces in Crimea. And listen, this is a shock. It's a shock not because the politicians don't lie, but normally, politicians on such a high level, when they lie, they're doing about something that can be denied, that you cannot prove it. For example, was it a classical interference? Who interfered in the American elections and so on? We can have a quite strong opinion on this, but factually, it's more difficult to say President Putin knew about this and that. With the Russian special forces in Crimea, 20 hours after he made the statement, all the Western intelligence knew the names of the people that were there. And by the way, Russian president himself gave them medals two weeks late. So then why he's lying? And here's my interpretation. He's lying in order to be called a liar. And then to say a liar like you. What about the weapons for mass destruction in Iraq? So this is how you're basically imitating, and his message was, now we're imitating the real thing. <laughs> Now Everything we're not, is now about we're not power. Imitating the With liberal Trump democracy? is very yeah. important. Trump basically, the major, the most radical, there are three radical things that Trump really did. The first is he said America is the biggest loser of the post-Cold War decades. Listen, for us it was an American world. And suddenly he said America is the biggest victim. Every screwing up us. We're losing all the time. And you're going to see how the Americans can basically believe it. But if you're an American worker who lost his jobs because of the globalization and basically uh, the, the production went to China or other places, it's not so difficult for you to believe it because you believe that you lost. It's probably not true for America, but for him it is true. 
Secondly, let's give you one example, because this was the most important about the American change. Certain things that you find as the symbol of your power suddenly became the symbol of your vulnerability. For example, the spread of English language normally is perceived as one of the best signs of the American influence in the world. But because of the fact that almost everybody is learning or trying to understand something in English, several things happened to the Americans which are not as positive as you can expect. First, because everybody speaks English, Americans stop learning foreign languages. Uh, on the level of basically learning of the foreign language, the United States really went very much in the bottom. Secondly, because everybody speaks English, Everybody has the feeling, at least, that they understand how the American society functions, so they know how to interfere there. For example, the Chinese know very well what are the battleground states on the American elections, so if they want to hurt President Trump, they know what kind of a goods they basically <laughs> should put tariffs on. Uh, when basically uh, Mr. Shoigu uh, was uh, appointed uh, to become the Russian Minister of Defense, according uh, 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 to the reports, President Putin told him, and you're going to deal with the Americans, don't put too much effort to study them, it's enough to see the House of Cards. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, suddenly America became transparent to the world, but the world became opaque to America, because Americans go to places like Bulgaria, and they're going to speak to the English speakers in Bulgaria. So talking to me, they believe that they have talked to the whole Bulgarian people. But it's not exactly like this. The very fact that I speak English already, I'm one of the basically winners of the change, because speaking English is one of the major distinctive story why certain people are doing better than others. You have an access to international uh, networks. You can be invited in the Bali. You can be translated. Uh, people who does not speak English has a very different view of what's happening in his own country, particularly if he's not living in the major cities. So suddenly, America was blinded by the very fact that so many people speak English. And I'm saying all this because in business, the imitators are the worst competitors. They're taking your competitive advantages and using them against you. And there was a very important book which was written at the very moment when uh, Trump was elected uh, by a, a great uh, British historian, uh, Mr. Sims, who is a, a co-author. And this is one of the beautiful books only historians can write. He took all the interviews that President Trump gave from 1980, his famous first political interview, to the first day when he announced his candidacy for president. Only interviews. He was not interested in books and so on that were written by other people. And he checked just one thing. Is there certain positions that have been consistent? Is there something that never changed in his views for over this period? And he ended up with three things. First, what kind of victor America was in the Cold War, I mean in the World War II, if the Germans and Japanese are living so well. How it is possible that America is buying German and Japanese cars? To basically win for him, it means not simply that you're doing well, but the defeated should do bad. The idea that you should help the defeated and integrate, this is something that he basically rejects. So from this point of view, his obsession with the German cars is the obsession that post-World War II America totally changed the idea of what it means to be a victor. Victory means that somebody else should suffer, those who is losing. Also on the trade things, for all these years, not for a single minute in his life, he believed that trade is a win-win game. He basically said, for me to win, somebody should lose. And thirdly enough, the third topic which never changed and he was very consistent on was the obsession with Iran. Because he was socialized politically at the moment when America was humiliated through the hostage uh, uh, taking in Tehran. So for him, the uh, obsession... Under President Carter. Jimmy uh, Carter. Under President <laughs> Carter. So for him, Iran was basically the major manifestation of the willingness and in a certain way, incapability of the American elites to define the American interests. Why am I saying all this? The reason Trump believes that America is a loser, and the reason the Trump voter in Michigan 
who voted uh, and agreed with this scheme are totally different reasons. The only thing that they share is resentment towards the claim of the American elites, and by the way, both Democrats and the Republicans, that this is an American century. They don't feel it like this. And this was quite important. And the second the thing, liberal, the internationalist yeah. liberal claims. Yeah, international yeah. liberal claims, because yeah. also the Republicans. Yeah. And the second thing that was critically important is, I was talking to somebody who voted Trump, and very kind of, uh, not educated, very intelligent person, and I was asking different questions, and one of the questions I said, are you bothered by the fact that he could be quite economical with the truth? He's lying from time to time, it happens to him. And the guy said something which is, was profound. He said, no, no, no. He's the only one that he's not, who is not lying. Because he's, he said he lied, of course, all the time about certain facts. But he's not lying about the most important thing, that everything is about him. Well, either politicians are claiming that it is about us. He's honest because he said everything is about me. My interest and this and that. And I said, OK, but normally people, and in Bulgaria, to be honest, this is good to be Bulgarian. You never blame other people for voting for strange people. I have been doing this all my life, so I, this is why I should not be uh, kind of critical to these people. But I said, normally, when you vote for the populist, normally some of these people could be responsible, but they're, how to say, good people. You know, at least, he's quite mean person, and he's not hiding this. Why are you doing this? And here is the answer which I also find eye-opening. He said, do you know what? Imagine that you should go to court and you believe that the system is totally corrupt and rigged. What kind of lawyer you are going to hire? The high-minded lawyer or the nastiest of the lawyers? He said, I believe that the system is rigged and I hired the nastiest of the lawyers. I'm saying all this because this is, from a certain point of view, particularly people who speak only in economic terms, they said, how is possible these people who really lost very much out of the economic changes? I mean, why the American workers basically are voting for somebody who is filthy rich, who does not care about them, and who is not going to change their lives? Because of the fact that they shared incredibly intensive anger that the system is rigged. And I do believe and the that international liberal system, li which yeah. the American and Central one, is and one not of working the major for them. problems with the liberal message is telling people, no, no, but you are living well. I'm telling you, you're fine. Uh, and listen, there is nothing. And they don't believe that. It's, it's not even not about believing. In the democracy, it's about feeling. In, no, no. In democracy, the most important is that you know best how you feel. This is about democracy. My vote means that I know best how I feel. And then comes somebody. It's not simply that you're not feeling well, but he's also asking you to tell that you're feeling well. Which is, this is extremely kind of, uh, this is extremely powerfully can trigger certain type of an anger. Because in a normal situation, you can say to a person, listen, I understand that you're not feeling well. Let's try to do this and that. But if you're telling him, no, you don't understand. In fact, you're much better than you have been 10 years ago, or you're going to be here and there, and then people go mad. And some of them go mad for good reasons, some they go mad for the bad reasons, but they feel the attack at the heart of their power, that somebody knows better than them how they feel. And I do believe in most of our countries, there was a lot of speculations, because, listen, this kind of a resentment brought to people, to power, people, many of them totally corrupt extremely ruthless. By the way, not all of them are corrupt. I want to be also fair because uh, the idea that all the populists in Central and Eastern Europe is totally corrupt is also not particularly true. Mr. Kaczynski is not personally corrupt. He is a 19th century nationalistic politician, and paradoxically, people liked him for the same people the British used like Corbyn, because for 40 years he didn't change at all. Is it good somebody not to change for 40 years? I don't know, but he's like this. He believed in 1989 what he believes now. Mr. Orban cannot be accused of being insensitive uh, to material part uh, 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 of the world. Uh, 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 but uh, because power and, uh, power and money are much more uh, fixed there. But I'm saying this, people are doing this quite often without any illusions for whom they're voting. 
because they tried to say to send a signal. And for us, it was very important, instead of uh, demonizing these people, to try to understand the signal about what they're sending. Yeah. We asked Kirian Esser to um, read out certain fragments we selected. Kirian Esser is a famous actor and works for the theater troupe. And uh, we've chosen um, Vaclav Havel um, as a first fragment, 1994. Speech to the European Parliament on the occasion of the entrance of the Czech lands, of the Czech Republic, by that time no longer the Czechoslovak Republic, but the Czech Republic. Um, his speech to the European Parliament in Strasbourg at that moment. Um, I think it's a wonderful speech. It's a main speech. We choose a very short part of it, Miriam. Western Europe has been moving toward its present degree of integration for nearly 50 years. It is clear that new members, particularly those attempting to shed the consequences of communist rule, cannot be accepted overnight into the European Union without seriously threatening to tear the, delica the delicate threads from which it is woven. Nevertheless, the prospect of its expansion and of the expansion of its influence and spirit is in its intrinsic interest and in the intrinsic interest of Europe as a whole. There is simply no meaningful alternative to this trend. Anything else would be a return to the times when the European or order was not of a work of, of consensus, but only of violence. And the evil demons are lying in wait. A vacuum, the decay of values, the fear of freedom, suffering and poverty, chaos, these are the environments in which they flourish. They must not be given that opportunity. For if the future European order does not emerge from a broadening European Union based on the best European values and willing to defend and transmit them, it could well happen that the organization of this future will fall into the hands of a cast of fools, fanatics, populists and demagogues waiting for their chance and determined to promote the worst European traditions. And there are, unfortunately, more than enough of those. Thank you, um, 1994, if I read this passage, um, I read your book, there's so much in common, <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, but to tune in maybe on um, the fact that we're talking about imitation, We've, you've been talking about imitation, um, and the imitation of Central and Eastern Europe and um, maybe even of Russia for a while, going through the movements of liberalism, and the Chinese rejecting that and putting down the Tiananmen uh, 1989 uprising. Um, reactions to the liberal, uh, the, 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 the winning of the West, but um, he's proposing a return to Europe. And that's what he always said, Václav Havel, and he's alluding to this again. And why wasn't it possible for Central Europe to return, to simply return to Europe, instead of imitating it. Um, was that the doing of the Western Europeans telling, and the Central Europeans, and telling them off, not allowing them to come in? No, listen, it's a great question. There is one thing in the book that is not there. This is not the book that is blaming Western Europe or the United States for the situation now. No, but I'm a Western and, uh, European, no, I remember 1989 very well. So no, but this is why I'm I telling you, this is very important, because listen, to return to what? I'm never going to forget, in 90, this same year, 1994, I was in Belgrade, uh, as uh, it was 1993, in fact, December, uh, as observer for the elections. And then one of the member of the Politburo of the Milosevic party uh, and very senior advisor to Milosevic at this moment, was a famous Marxist philosopher and dissident from the 1970s, Mikhail Markovic. This was the famous Praxis group, I mean, well known. I'm sure that they could have been even in the Bali back then. Uh, and I was asking him, but Mr. Markovic, you have been all your life a Marxist and so on. You have been against the communist system what you're doing in the Politburo of the Milosevic party? So it was a genuine question. So it was not a kind of rhetoric. And he said, but you cannot understand we are trying to become European. For him, being European was to become a nation state in the way Europe was before 
World War II. And the most important is Europe has changed for the Cold War period very much. You cannot return to Europe because Europe was not staying there anymore. Listen, the idea of the state based on a nation, the idea of kind of ethnically homogeneous societies and others, it was quite common to Europe before. Yeah. And from this point of view, uh, one of the major divides... In the 50s and 60s? In the 50s and 70s, yeah. but even uh, before it. So suddenly Europe has moved, and in order to return to Europe, we should go to, another diff we should go to a different place. Because Europe was not there where we can return from where we left. And I do believe this was very important. This is also interesting when, uh, uh, when Havel is saying this, and, uh, 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 because uh, 1994, we forget that Yugoslav war was basically starting to peak. And the idea that uh, the transition of Central and Eastern Europe is going to be peaceful and democratic cannot be taken for granted at all. People are very quickly forgetting in the same way that, for example, uh, Stephen Holmes is telling me that uh, all these borrowings from the Constitution, not knowing that we were trying to stop three persons to run, in the same way people forgot that, for example, NATO was expanded in the first expansion, not because of Russia. It was very much the fear of the Yugoslav wars and the rise of nationalism within Central and Eastern Europe that brought the three Central European presidents to go to Clinton and to say, listen, if you're not going to integrate us in a certain way, the things can go really wrong. Because then Yugoslavia was totally captured the mind of Europeans. Now, if you see how we are talking about the last 30 years, Yugoslavia is not there anymore. People have forgotten that there was the fear that East Europeans can go back to war, and you remember all these stories, ethnic nationalism is coming back. I'm saying this, so from this point of view, return to Europe and joining Europe, they sounded very similar rhetorically, but the story was, do you want to go to where Europe is now, or, or do you want to go back where it was? And going back where it was sounds very uh, differently. And this was an important question because in 1989, unlike in the Western Europe in 1945, nationalism was not a defeated force at the end of communism. Nationalists and the liberals have been a major allies in overthrowing communism. Uh, if you go back to solidarity and if we want to be fair to the facts, there was a very strong nationalistic wink of solidarity because nationalism was very much about rejecting Soviet Union, rejecting Soviet domination. It was about sovereignty. So many of the people that we see today uh, uh, at the head of the uh, governing party of Poland, they didn't change their views. They were, they, they were like they this back then. Yeah, they yeah, were. They yeah. were. Yeah. Uh, 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 and they were there, but then liberals and nationalists had a common goal, and the common goal was getting for uh, in European Union and for the NATO, for both of them were valuable, but for different reasons. Uh, for the nationalists, it was much more getting out of the Soviet sphere of influence. For the liberals, this was also the way to try to stop the rise of nationalism in their own countries. And you can very much follow this kind of a, uh, the coalition when they started basically, the coalition between liberals and nationalists at the, uh, the late 1990s basically was uh, starting to disintegrate. I'm saying all of this because one of the stories to go as possibly historically to the context as possible, and to try to understand where all these people have been, what they have been thinking about, for example, why the nationalism suddenly muted in the 1990s? And the reason was the Yugoslav Wars. Because also during the Yugoslav Wars, nationalism was very much associated with the ex-communists, Milosevic. And for the Polish nationalists, most of them being uh, very strong anti-communists, they cannot share the language because this was also destroying their own biographies. So for 10 years, the language went very much there, but the nationalist sentiment was always there. Mm -hmm. And there's, I mean, we could go into almost every sentence half of yeah. the road here, but I'm going to go into one more. Um, that's also partly why we took this one. Um, Europe is expanding, eh? and there's simply no meaningful alternative to this trend. Um, there's many, many things to be said about this, but in the light of your book, um, you point out that by the time that the liberals started to think that there was no alternative to the ways they were thinking and organizing society, 
and even to the ways the central banks were organizing society and a lot of their civil servants who weren't elected were organizing society and central European society, if there's no alternative, then it becomes undemocratic and then it becomes illiberal and then uh, liberalism is defeated by itself, as you point out in, 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 in many ways. But, but there, are, there is, of course, an alternative, uh, simply a, there's a meaningful alternative to the trend, and Boris Johnson has just shown us that there's a meaningful um, alternative to the trend because he took Europe, uh, uh, Britain, Great Britain out of the European Union, and then I'm wondering, um, the resentment of Trump and that they lost, that America has lost um, uh, too much in the American century, is this resentment of the Brits the same, that they lost the Second World War and now they're buying German cars? And now they, I mean, they liberated the continent twice and suddenly they lose out in Europe. Is it again the same resentment used by Johnson as a, as a meaningful alternative to the ever-expanding expansion of the European ideal? No, I do believe, uh, of course, there is part of it, but in a strange way, if you see the structure of the support for Brexit, it comes from two totally different groups, like in the US. You have people like Boris Johnson, one of the best things, by the way, I have ever read about uh, the Brexit, and particularly Johnson, was an article in Financial Times, uh, which was very much referring to the experience of some of the leaders of the Brexit as uh, very active parts of the Oxford uh, Union debating societies. So these are people who basically are very brilliant on a certain level, but their brilliance does not mean that they should be very much interested in the content or details. The Oxford Union is that you should win the debate. And winning the debate is what matters and what is going to happen after that. But for people like Johnson, because uh, in a certain way, he is also nostalgic. For the Great Britain Empire and tradition for global Britannia, which has disappeared, and for him, Europe was not global enough in a certain way. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, for people like him, uh, independent Britain, UK on its own, is going to be more global than the European Union was. On the other side, for many of the people who voted for him, particularly in some of the rural areas and others, there's much more nostalgia for small England. They wanted to be an island. They want to be their own island. They was not dreaming so much about these stories, but these two nostalgia agreed in one. European Union does not help us. European Union is not what we wanted. Uh, and of course you have resentment towards London and the big cities, is London Europe. So I'm saying all this because the strange story about populism is this is always a strange coalitions that you don't expect to come. One of those totally patrician uh, Boris Johnson coming from private schools and so on, being basically elected with the votes of the traditional labor constituencies. Uh, what labor, basically, for all these years, have been trained in one thing, to hate, to the bottom of their heart, people like Boris Johnson. This was like, because British society is a very class society, uh, and from this point of view, the class divide was very strong, and this type of aristocratic elites and so on was very strongly rejected. But then, and this is the interesting story about charismatic leaders. Charismatic leaders are leaders which bridge positions which till yesterday were looking as totally unbridgeable. And they agreed on this. And this is, I was always shocked by the way, one thing, because uh, uh, I go to London, I, I also visit Russia at least three times per year. You cannot imagine the level of hostility between the two, not simply on political level. Russians had United, hated the United Kingdom more than they hate the United States. And Brits, to be honest, also have a strong feelings. Yeah. And the then, uh, yeah, towards the Russians. And then I was reading a great piece by Gideon Rahman in Financial Times, who said, this is the last two empires that was not defeated militarily, that basically everyone seen the other, their own decline. 
the last two colonial uh, in a certain way the last colonial empires. So it's a kind of a self hatred because basically none of this, none of United Kingdom or, or Russia had been militarily defeated. I mean, both of them basically did it. And you look at uh, in Britain and you hate everything about you hate about yourself. Uh, you're basically reduced importance, certain type of irrelevance. You are not basically. A long decline yeah, and arranging, no, yeah. yeah, and I and found no this. I found this interesting because one of the criticism to the book, legitimate criticism, was you are putting too much psychology. And the problem with psychology and political science is that it cannot quantify it. But the story is, if you see in our day-to-day -day politics, to what extent most of the political consultants about psychology and not about kind of a quantifiable uh, economic data. So Cambridge Analytica is not interested about the incomes of the people that they try to affect. They're much more trying to construct certain levels in which you're moving the sentiments. So it is very strange when psychology is more and more becoming central to the when to the way politicians are making votes, while at the same time political science tries basically to focus only on measurable, quantifiable things, basically try to just get something that you, we can quantify. I do believe that this is kind of a divorce which is making political science quite irrelevant on many things when basically we just go to things that we believe that we have data for. I'm going to ask Kirian Essa to read out the second uh, um Part we um, second part of text we we've chosen. It's a, it's by a Hungarian writer, novelist, been a guest of the Bali uh, twice. Gyuri Konrad, deceased not yeah, too long ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, the special quality of Europe is culture. 2001, uh, a vision for Europe. A little bit after Havel. Mm -hmm. What is the role of culture in European integration? Permanent and determining. Coherent European culture existed before European economic and political association, since the former depends on relationships between individuals, while the latter depends upon relationships between states. And individuals come together easier than states. Europe's innovation, cultural pluralism, is victorious worldwide. It is a tendency parallel to the spread of philosophy of human rights, whose basis is a requirement to respect the human individual. Europe's special quality is no plan, but rather something which already exists, a sensitive attraction to diversity kept coherent by European humanism. This, this pluralist sensitivity penetrates to the details, all the way to the core of personality and to all of its momentary states. At the same time, it does not break with those fundamental principles, outgrowths of Judeo-Christian and antique humanist traditions, which have been rationalized by European world, worldly thought since the Enlightenment. Europe's special quality lies in the balance between the universal and the particular, the general and the specific, the shared and the individual. Thank you, Guillaume. Guri Konrad. Um, and now, we have cho we've chosen this for many reasons, but also um, for the fact, the last sentence. Um, your special quality lies in the balance between the, the universal and the particular, the general and the specific, the shared and the individual. Um, if the liberal order of the West, Europe and America, um, um, is no longer valid every everywhere in the world. I mean, how come? Is it, isn't it universalist? Isn't it the fact that everybody, if you ask them, would rather be free and choose for himself? Um, isn't, isn't, I mean, isn't it a bit weird to say that to other peoples, um, might they be in Central Europe, Russia, China, or wherever, um, are not prone to like freedom, free movement, free expression, all the liberal um, inventions of the West or the liberal rule of law? But listen, it's an interesting story because many of these people, they're going to tell you that they're universalists, they like this, all these things, but not because of Europe. 
And this is why we have a China chapter. None of us, by the way, is a specialist on China. Mm -hmm. uh, but we very much have the China chapter to make one point. There was one major country which was never part of the age of imitation, and this was China. China's major story was we have been borrowing, but we never imitate. So everything is with the Chinese characteristics. Uh, not imitating the West was the major message of the Chinese Communist Party. One of, uh, because now some of the transcripts of the decision for Tiananmen were taken, uh, one of the triggering moments for the Chinese Communists uh, to go and to uh, basically uh, destroy the students' movement, to go with violence, was when they see the copy of the status of liberty being put on Tiananmen. And the story is we're not going to imitate the United States. Why I'm saying this? Because at the same time, Chinese have been borrowed a lot. They have even kind of uh, taken certain technologies which were not loaned to them. Uh, but why they, this is important? They've, rob they've robbed them somewhere. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but why this is quite important? It is important also because at the same time, China believes that they're universalists. Uh, we talk about the rise of China. In China, there is no concept like the rise of China. The concept is the return of China. Chinese believe that they have been dominating the world and just for short two or three centuries, the Westerners took it over because of an accident uh, and now they're back where they were. Uh, I'm saying this because the interesting story is, I agree with many people who believe that uh, particularly the competition and the rivalry between the United States and China are going to shape very much the world to come. But the most important about China is China wants to dominate the world, but China is not interested to create a replica of the China regime, which was not true during the Mao period. Mao was exporting ideology much more than the Soviets. If you go to Africa and you see basically the idea of a peasant revolution and the Chinese Communist Party and so on, now Chinese are not doing this for two reasons. First, they do believe that China is too exceptional and too special, so nobody can imitate them. But secondly, exactly because they have been on both on the side of the import, but also exporting during the communist period, they are not interested, for example, in making Netherlands like China. They are simply interested in Netherlands to do what China wants. If you basically want to have a democracy, have a democracy, it's fine. But be sure that if uh, we insist that you're going to get, for example, Huawei, you're going to get it. And uh, this goes with other projects. I do believe this is a different world. Uh, this is about asymmetrical relationship. And in the book, we're making this point. From this point of view, also China and the United States are very different in the way they know the world. America knows the world to the extent that they can transform the world. How America knows the world? Through the melting pot. People from all over the world go to the United States and you're making Americans out of them. You have Bulgarians, you have here, there, everybody goes, and you're integrated in the American society. How China knows the world? Through the Chinatowns. Chinatowns are not trying to transform the cities around them. They're trying to keep their identity, and they try basically to exploit all the economic possibilities and power possibilities around. So from this point of view, I do believe that the age of, imi the age of imitation is very much also related to the rise of China, which basically is fighting for the globalization, but Soviet Union wanted to remake the world in the way the, the Western liberalism wants. Yeah, Soviet they, Union, they wanted to convert yeah, the rest they wanted of the world to, convert. to communism. They wanted yeah. to convert. They believed yeah. in replicas. And the liberals want to convert and the, liberals the rest of the world also because to liberalism. we believed in our universalism. We yeah. believe that all people are here. And there is one major contradiction at the core, particularly of the American cultural liberalism at the moment, about which I do believe we also should be honest to talk about. On one side, we talk about liberalism and saying that all others are basically like us. But on the other side, we believe that I, for example, being a Bulgarian, cannot understand somebody coming from a different culture, be it different gender or so on. For example, you're going to see in the United States, and I know that this was debated here, if I decide to write a novel, and this novel is from the perspective of a Latino woman, this is going to be a scandal. People are going to tell you, how do you believe that you can really can feel the world in which the Latino woman is feeling the world? And I understand the criticism, but on the other side is, how if I cannot feel the world in the way she feels, universalism is possible. Universalism is based on the fact that we have at least theoretically human capacity 
to fill the world through the eyes of the people who are not like us. This is at the center, that there was a, some important human uh, nature which allows us to relate to everybody in the world. People who are very different politically, culturally, and so on. So from this point of view, th there is a tension between the identity politics that comes and this type of universalist tradition. So on one level, you're telling the Chinese or the Russians or anybody else, listen, we know and we have the right to tell you this and that because you're human like us and we know that all humans basically value freedom. But on the other, if I'm going basically to write a novel from the point of view of the Chinese person, by the same people I'm going to tell, you never can feel the world like them. Listen, it's either or. So you're, say, either we so stay you're saying the politics of identity are under I do believe this is, no, I do believe it's a contradiction. I, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that it is good or bad. And by the way, saying that something is good and bad, what it means. If people want to express themselves, they're going to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So from this, I don't have any problem. I do believe that our universalism is very strange because we're universalist on export, but we're not basically universalist in our own society. Because if you see the all different type of identity politics, what it means to be Bulgarian for me today, to tell you, you are never going really to understand what it is about Bulgaria. But to be honest, you could. To tell you that it's a, such a special place that nobody can understand is not particularly true. And probably even I can understand what it means to be a Dutch. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, I do believe this is important things. And this is uh, the thing that really interests uh, both of us. We didn't put it in the book, but the Peaks of European Enlightenment universalism will pick on colonization. Because paradoxically, universalism goes with power. And the interesting story is how you can be universalist when you don't feel too powerful. And this is, a, in my view, a real question. How are you a universalist if you don't believe that you can transform the world around you? Because this is what changed in Europe, for example, in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, the major question in Europe was how we can transform people around us. And now the question is how not to allow those around us to transform us. See how the debate on Russia changed, how the debate on Turkey changed. Uh, and I do believe this is something that is very critical for the universalist vision. And normally we try to decouple universalism from power but it's not, it's, it's not true, it's to connected. be honest. It's connected, yeah. and I do believe this is one of the major issues. How you can keep your universalist appeal and universalist view of the world, even mm -hmm. if you don't believe that you can transform the world to become like you. Universalism, uh, uh, liberalism, and China. We're going to the last fragment. I'm going to ask Kiri and Esa to read out the last fragment. It's by Bertolt Brecht. Uh, difficult, difficulty of governing. Um, it's um, a poem. It's uh, from the, I believe it's from the 50s. I'm not sure. From mm. where. Yeah. Ministers are always telling the people how difficult it, it is to govern. Without the ministers, corn would grow into the ground, not upward. Not a lump of coal would leave the mine if the chancellor weren't so clever. Without the minister of propaganda, no girl would ever agree to get pregnant. Without the minister of war, there'd never be a war. Indeed, whether the sun would rise in the morning without the Fuhrer's permission is very doubtful, and if it is, it would be in the wrong place. It's just as difficult, so they tell us, to run a factory. Without the owner, the walls would fall in and the machines rust, so they say. Even if a plow could get made somewhere, it would never reach a field without the cunning words the factory owner writes the peasants. Who could otherwise tell them that plows exist? And what would become of an estate without a landlord? Surely they'd be sowing rye where they'd set the potatoes. If governing were easy, there'd be no need for such inspired minds as the Führer's. If the worker knew how to run his machine, and the peasant could tell his field from a pastry board, there'd be no need for a factory owner or landlord. It's only because they are all so stupid that a few are needed who are so clever. Or could it be that governing is so difficult only because swindling and exploitation 
take some learning. Thank you, Kirian. Um, again, um, I said it's from the 50s, it's not. It's from the late 1930s, and it's written from Moscow, uh, which is interesting because it's criticizing the Fuhrer, of course, as a German he was. It's at the same period as the worst prosecution of the party under Stalin. Um, so it um, might be uh, seen as a criticism of Hitler, but maybe it was also a criticism of Stalin. Um, but it's uh, about, the, uh, about um, the difficulty of governing. It ties in with a lot of what you've written and what you've said about how it really feels different if you speak only Bulgarian and if you think you speak to Ivan Krastev as an American that you've spoken to everybody in, <laughs> in Bulgaria. Um, and that's true, um, and you already started talking about it, but that's true about the last part, of course. Um, the last part of the book is about China. Um, China has been governed by a very, very small group of people, a very clever group, um, but um, uh, they, they managed to rule an immense empire. And um, what's interesting about many things is that, indeed, you describe how they avoided imitating um, the... the, the um, uh, in the way the rest of the world did that, but they just borrowed or robbed um, uh, a lot of the, 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 the techniques of how the West was. Um. But then you're saying, somewhere at the end of the book, you're saying um, that it's interesting, China um, is not just a nation state, um, it's, uh, it's a civilization. And it's... Um, it's just happened to, if it has to interact with the rest of the world, it needs to take the form of a nation state, but it's not. They see themselves as totally different. They see themselves as a civilization which spans the globe with the Chinatowns. And, um, but, um, um, but then you're saying, and maybe come edging to the last part of the conversation, and then we um, will uh, have the audience joining in, but you're saying that in a way this French Revolution type of enlightenment ideologies, either, might they be liberal or communist, um, are over. We're entering a period in which we are, uh, liberalism is not over as such because there's need for liberalism, but, but we're entering a period of market capitalist worldwide, and the Chinese no longer believe in the Marxist idea. But isn't it um, maybe true that this sort of post-Christian Marxist idea, Marxist as post-Christian, and the idea that you're universalist, and we had Tom Holland here a few days ago who wrote, written a book, Dominion, about you know, how all the Western ideas are post-Christian and it's dominion because it's, it's, it's ruling the world by that. It's trying to be universalist because there's power behind it. Because So if China is a different civilization, might it not be that we're in, because you're writing very worrying things about the clash of America and China at the end of the book, I mean, and if we, I take that literally, it's really very worrying because it's pointing to the direction of war. But um, that might be another clash of civilization. It's a different, it's not a post-Christian, it's not uh, universalist in that respect. You just describe it yourself. They don't care whether we are democracies or not. They care whether we buy who are why. So aren't we in for another big confrontation between two ideas? So first, uh, as I started, is the fact that out of all the chapters, uh, the chapter on China for us was the biggest gamble because there was something that I don't have the feeling that we know enough, but probably because of it we have been much more curious and kind of open to others. There is one problem with the Chinese. Uh, by the way, we either, either usually see others as more stupid and weak than they are, or we start to view them as much wiser than they are. Uh, and uh, at the moment, basically, I do believe we have this type of a problem with the Chinese. Uh, you remember this famous story in which, uh, I don't remember which, who asked, was it Kissinger or Nixon, asked Joe and Line, what do you think about the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to say. And as a result of it, everybody is saying how long-term Chinese are and so on. And then the translator, who was interpreting the conversation, recently wrote an article in New York Times and he said, honestly speaking, I believe that John Line believed that we're asking him about 1968. 
And because the conversation was in 1978, it was quite normal for him to say that probably it's too early to say. Uh, uh, so in a strange way, I do believe that part of the crisis of the Western model is that we are trying to see also the Chinese as much more effective and kind of flawless than probably they are. But there is something important. Like you, I, I do believe, and of course there is a lot of literature, the famous book by Graham Allison about the two-seated trap and so on and so on. Uh, you have a hegemon in crisis, which is the United States. You have a rising power. What is the difference between, for example, Soviet Union uh, and China when it comes to the confrontation with the United States? It's first, in economic terms, never in its history, Ch uh, Soviet Union was so economically powerful with respect to the United States as China is with respect to the United States now. And secondly, we're talking a very big place with a lot of people. Does it mean that they're going to clash? How they're going to clash? I don't know. But normally, the, this type of a rivalry and competition, I have spent some time in the United States last year, and to be honest, it was absolutely amazing to see it. Uh, because just a year ago, in the United States, you can hear different views on China. There were people, including Kissinger himself, saying how China and the America together can govern the world. And then overnight, this changed. And now if there is one thing on which Democrats and Republicans agree, this is on China. The competition is who is more hawkish on China. And this is interesting because, of course, some of their kind of fears are based on very real stuff. For example, the Chinese type of a state capitalism is giving them a major advantages when it comes to collecting data for the artificial intelligence. We have privacy, so we are making it much more difficult for people to collect data. For artificial intelligence, what really matters is how much data do you have. And basically, Chinese are collecting data on everything. Uh, it was also interesting for me to understand to what extent we also cannot see the world with the eyes of the Chinese. I was talking by somebody, a German colleague, who is a real specialist on China. And like everybody, I was very much interested in the social score system. You know the famous system in which, basically, in China, everything that you're doing is giving you a scores. If you're behaving well, and behaving well means in everything. If you're returning the credits that you're getting, if you're helping old people to cross the street, uh, if you're basically loyal to the Communist Party, then you're going to be rewarded, and the rewards are you're going to have a free ticket to visit your parents back in the village. Uh, but if you're not doing well, then probably, you, not probably, but you are going to be not allowed to use the railway system. So for us, it's a major scandal, and basically most of the Western um, analysis is that the Chinese uh, basically totally uh, against this. So I will ask this person who has spent a lot of time in China, and he told me two things which for me was eye-opening. He said Chinese are not so negative towards the social score system as we expect. For two reasons, he said, Ivan, you should know better than me. And he said, first, do you remember what worried people most when you have been under the communist system? That you're going to be framed for something that you have not done. This is the problem with any arbitrary power. You're not afraid, the most awful thing is that you're going to be put on jail for something that you have not done. He said, from this point of view, the fact that there is a total surveillance for them gives certain type of a documentation and they do believe that they can easily defend themselves if somebody decided to put there. And secondly, he said, most of uh, the younger people in China are one-child families, so they have spent a lot of their time uh, playing computer games because there is no other kids in the house. Uh, not that when you have other kids you cannot play computer games, just to be. Uh, but as a result of it, they are very much socialized in this idea of rewarding punishment that comes with these games. So for them, it comes much more natural than we can imagine. Why I'm saying all this? Because I do believe that the most important, if you're right, that we have this type of a civilizational clash, not in terms of uh, Huntington, so this is not the religious uh, civilization that he's talking about, but for totally different views of the world, is to try to imagine exactly 
how they view, why they tolerate or don't tolerate certain things, what worries them and don't worries them. And from this point of view, this is important. And here I'm going, before going to this, to end up on something optimistic very much about the West. There is one good thing about having a crisis and particularly populist type of a crisis. You certainly became curious about your own society. You start coming to the Bali, you start talking to people, even Bulgarians. Uh, uh, you start, because you have the feeling that there is something that we are not understanding. And this is also my feeling, this is the reason why this book was written. You have the feeling that we don't know something, what is going on, even in the head of my neighbor. This is a major advantage. Because I believe that democracy has one major advantage against authoritarian type of societies, nevertheless how sophisticated they are and how technologically advanced they are. And the advantage comes from the following, not that democracies are doing better economically, this being a Bulgarian, I don't buy this for a moment, to be honest, but the modern person is all the time dissatisfied. Nevertheless, of what we're doing, at some point we get dissatisfied with what we're doing. And democracy allows you to act on your dissatisfaction. It could be illusionary, it could be this and that, but at least I can change the government. And in the other system, you should overperform all the time. In a certain way, I can imagine how you are legitimate, nevertheless that you are not doing well economically in the Western societies. It's interesting for me to see how the Chinese government, if they're not delivering economic growth and standards of living are going to be perceived by legitimate by their own society and how basically they can uh, succeed to have the results that they have without having a much more social control and violence uh, in the way it is. So this is probably part of this thinner and happy ending part of our book that was also there. Yeah, the, happy, the happy ending of the book is in the fact that um, the fact that it probably um, the historical moment uh, is coming back because it's necessary for the rule of law, liberal democracies to think about um, um, how they came about and what their co core values are and what makes them so successful uh, if you compare that to others. So there's. There's two, there's two um, uh, possibilities for the reader. Um, it failed or it just dimmed, and it's the dimming which is making it possible that it will shine again. Uh, when you quote Brecht and talking about the rule of law, let's give you one other quote from Brecht and the rule of law tradition. He said, it is not a crime to rope a bank. It is a crime to have a bank. Uh, so from this point of view, even the rule of law tradition in Europe has went through different articulations. And basically, people like Brecht are part of this tradition too. So from this point of view, it's never that the rule of law was not contested <laughs> in our part of the world. Thank you very much, uh, Ivan, for um, talking um, uh, um, to us and sharing all your s insights and, uh, and um, preoccupations and jokes. Um, are there people who would like to ask a question? Um, and a question is a sentence with a question mark at the end. Um, please, yeah, over here. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I, I will hold it for you. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, uh, so I have a question uh, related to the post-socialist generation. Um, my experience in the Western Balkans, specifically with the youth, is that uh, there's no pessimism or optimism, there's fatalism, and they all have no interest in participating politically. So you must have seen it as well in Bulgaria, I believe. So, so I'm really curious, what is their role to play? Because as of now, they don't see their role, they don't want to have a role. They just see that their destiny is in the hands of another, and they move away. Yeah. I'll be very quick on this. This is an extremely important question. I didn't touch on anything which is demography related here. But the story is the following. One of the major characteristics of the younger generation in the Balkans or Bulgaria in general is it's a very small cohort. They don't have the numbers. So even when they go basically and vote, they're going to be always outvoted. And secondly, like the previous generation, they face a choice and this choice is very easy to be done. So in order to change your life, what is easier? To try to change the government in your country or simply try to change the country? 
why to try to make Bulgaria or Serbia, or I don't know, Bosnia, like Netherlands, when I can come to Netherlands? And I do believe this creates a very special situation in which the younger generation is very easy to live. It's not that they're not politically engaged and so on. Some of these people care a lot, but for them, individual choice and the fact that it's also strongly individualistic generations makes it. But I do believe in Europe in general, the generational disbalance, unlike the generation of 68, which was a very big cohort, there was a lot of them. You cannot neglect them politically. In place like Serbia, uh, for example, you can win the elections without being interested how this generation is going to vote. And I do believe this creates a very particular dynamics. And I do believe that in some of our countries, the intergenerational conflicts are going to be one of the most important. Uh, because also, don't forget, the older generation has a very important legitimate claim. They paid the highest price of transition. If you see the pension of this generation, if you also see the fact that basically, also emotionally for them, all this change coming, nevertheless, where they stand politically. So this generation believes that they're the major victim. Uh, but this is a quite short-term uh, perspective. And then the younger people feeling that they don't know what to do. So this is why the young people, you're going to see a lot of them protesting on the streets, and you're not going to see them voting, because they feel very weak at the ballot box. So this total decoupling between youth political activism and voting, in my view, is one of the interesting things that we see not only in Eastern Europe, but particularly in the Balkans in Eastern Europe. Demographically, just to give you just two figures, because I, it's very important for me to imagine the scale of what we're talking about. If demographic projections are right, in the year 2040, the population of Bulgaria is going to be 40% less than it was in 1989. So the combination of aging, out-migration, and missing use creates this type of a, what you're calling fatalism. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, imitation, indeed, was a choice, uh, European integration. But the critique is afterwards that uh, with this process, there was a lot of uh, technocracy, box ticking, uh, doing things in place, which felt like, yeah, it was imposed in a way. True. Was there a better way to do it? Is there a better way to do it? And uh, for the new countries that want to exceed, for instance, do you think that any change will make sense or should it have, yeah, I'm yeah. referring to yeah. the decision to postpone with the yeah. newest candidates. Do you think it will make a difference the process or is it just postponing for the sake of postponing or something else thanks no i don't believe that it's, it's going to make a technical difference uh, because for the first time basically you try to go try to integrate not at the end but step by step but i don't believe that it is changing the major characteristics of the european integration this is a symmetrical process listen the paradox of democratization is that you're telling the people, now you're a democracy, so you're going to decide on your own, and basically you're going to deliberate your legislation, and so on. On the other side, European integration, and you cannot change this, is a club exists, and in order to be a member of the club, you're going to adopt certain legislation. Because people are talking about European negotiations. Negotiations between the candidate country and the European Union is the negotiations since when you start to adopt. European rules in a certain area. You are not discussing the rules, because the rules are there. You want to join this club. As a result of it, there was a single year in Hungary in which for the whole year, there was only one piece of legislation that was really deliberated in the parliament. Everything else was voting, European legislation, just adopting. And this is without, kind of, uh, uh, without legislation. Could it have been different? It cannot be much different. We should be honest about this. I do believe that one, one thing could be different, and this is because of the succession process, which was highly asymmetrical, and many of the Western civil servants, particularly not only Brussels, even the member states, have been treating the Central and East Europeans like students. They so much like this teacher-student relations that they decided that this is going to continue also when these countries enter the European Union. And then they suddenly see basically the revolt of the students. 
Uh, and this idea, now we are here, we also have a V2, right? You're not going to lecture us, you're not better than us, and so on, was also kind of the result of it. And of course, many of these people also doing this, I mean, many of our governments, uh, in order to cover other very real problems that we have. Uh, but I do believe that this was one of the way to try to understand that the accession process was something very exceptional, and the moment when these countries enter the European Union, it's not going to be the same. Of course, this experience makes West Europeans now absolutely scared of the fact that some new countries are going to come, and not for financial reasons. They see we cannot deal with all these people who have a veto right. Are we ready to give the veto right to seven other West Balkan countries? They're going to outvote us, they're going to do this and that. So paradoxically, uh, countries like Albania or Northern Macedonia, they're paying the price of countries of our countries. So in a certain way, this was uh, the, the shock which particularly some West Europeans get after Hungary v after Poland v on things they said, could we do it once again? But uh, on the other side, I don't believe that at the end of the day, uh, European Union simply can tell to these countries, do you know what, stay there, wait for us, <laughs> and let's see what's going to happen. Uh, because uh, paradoxically, these countries are already part of the European Union in many ways. So it's not going to be easy. I do believe that many things can be done differently when it comes to the way people talk and try to get some of the sensitivities, both uh, uh, East Europeans to get some of the sensitivity of West Europeans who see their money being transferred to the East and then being stolen there and basically going for supporting corrupt governments. I have a full sympathy for basically the worries of a Dutch taxpayer who said, I don't want my money to be given to the cousin of some of the East European political leaders. On the other side, trying to understand, for example, some of the problem of the use in the region has, why they cannot be effective here and there, is going to help. And here there is one thing which is positive about the crisis. When you have a crisis, people start to be interested in each other. Ten years ago, Germans didn't know anything about Greek economy. The financial crisis came and Germans became an expert on the Greek economy. <laughs> Five years ago, East Europeans didn't have a clue cool about the German asylum system. The refugee crisis came and now every Hungarian and Paul is an expert on the German asylum system. Uh, this sounds irony, but at the same time, we are starting to learn how it functions in different societies, and this is positive. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, yes, my question is, so in response to this sort of return of great power politics and the rise of China, etc., the, the debate here in Western Europe is very much moving towards a stronger uh, role for Europe and for the EU in the world. Um, President Macron has advocated for this. Uh, the European Commission calls itself uh, a geopolitical commission. Uh, the Dutch Prime Minister has said Europe should, should speak the language of power uh, in the world. Uh, how is all this viewed in, in Eastern Europe? And how feasible is, is all this discussion about a more geopolitical Europe if some of the European member states uh, don't believe in some of the most fundamental values uh, that Europe is trying to project in the world? Oh, this is a great question, but here it's not only about East Europeans. Uh, here are two uh, polling data that, if you don't know, could be interesting for you. On the eve of the European elections, European Council of Foreign Relations made a big survey in 14 EU member states. One of the questions was what Europe should do in the case of the major conflict between Russia and United States. Majority of every single country, including Poland, said we should remain neutral what Europe should do in the case of the major clash between the United States and China. Majority of every member states, including East Europeans, said we should remain neutral. So on one level, Europeans want Europe to play a global role, but on the other side, there is no any type of an idea that it means sacrifice, that you should do this or that. There is an abstract support for the idea of the uh, European army till the moment when you're going to ask who is going to lead it who is going to decide, who is going to be the commander in chief. I'm saying this because paradoxically European public opinion see the role of Europe very much in the way uh, the last Habsburg empire was seeing themselves. We want to be guaranteed by the foreign powers. Macron is different than this. He believes in the military power. I do believe with the geopolitical commission, uh, Van der Leyen is touching on something which is more interesting than it looks. For Europe, the idea that 
great power politics is a zero-sum game is much more painful than for any other global player because we are not a state. We cannot speak real politic. It's not that we don't want. We cannot, because the threat perception of Poland and Italy are totally different. Italians cannot understand why Russia is a problem and Poles cannot understand why Libya is a problem. And this is the reality, because of big plays, different history. So as a result of it, what basically the Commission put in climate change at the center is not so much about climate change only. And Van der Leyen is not a green politician, basically, <laughs> discovering uh, the merits of uh, vegetarianism. Uh, 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 basically, she basically is finding something different. She basically believes that when you're stressing climate change, you are attacking the very idea that global politics can be only a zero-sum game because there is one field on which how you are winning over the Chinese. You should try to push them to reduce their pollution because if they are not going to do it, nevertheless, of what we are doing, no difference. Europe is not the major polluter in the world. And secondly, they basically understand perfectly well that Europe does not have the power that we had before to tell others we're going to punish you for violating your human rights record because going and telling Chinese we're going to violate you for your human rights record, the Chinese are going to have welcome. Uh, uh, because in a certain way, nevertheless, that Europe is a trade power, of course, it has changed a lot. But Europe is saying, but do you know what? We can put a trade tariffs because you're polluting a lot. So suddenly you're trying to basically move to a language which allows you to exercise slightly more real power because real power in Europe is access to market. We have very big markets. Closing your market is a problem for everybody, including the Chinese and the Americans. Uh, investment is a bigger problem. For me, the real problem of Europe today is that on the level of technology, Europe basically is not competitive for the moment for the United States and for China. And if they're going to be a major clash between the United States and China, it's not going to be about ideology, or they can talk ideology, but it's going to be about technology. And then Europe is going to be squeezed to make a decision. And from this point of view, the story of Huawei and 5G and so on is a great story. Because in a certain way, it can turn to be as important debate as the Marshall Plan debate in the 1940s because it's not simply about certain technology, and it's not only what we believe about the Chinese companies. Basically, the Americans are saying, we are trading trade for security. If you're going to go on a Huawei, we are going to stop basically exchanging intelligence information with you. If you're not exchanging intelligent information with the Americans, what is the exact meaning of NATO? how you function if you don't share intelligence information. So I'm saying all this because I do believe the European Union is really going to be pushed for very tough choices. And here, strangely enough, uh, what is really bad about populism, particularly in our own countries, I mean Eastern Europe that I know better, it's not so much how illiberal many of these people are. Unfortunately, we're very provincial. Uh, it is very much for us, the world is about Europe. Seen from where we stand, we cannot see China. We see the United States in the way it was 10 years ago. Uh, we all, and from this point of view, how to make Europeans see the world commonly is the first. It's not about values, it's not about institutions. Is it possible that basically the Dutch public, the Bulgarian public, the Romanian public, the French public can agree what is happening in the world and what is the problem that we have? And for the moment, we are not uh, helping, in my view, each other very much with this. Uh, it's not simply that we have different values, but we have a totally different idea of what is happening in the world. Thank you very much, um, Ivan Krastev. I think I'm uh, gonna, I know there are many more questions in the audience. We've been exhausting you for almost two hours um, talking to us and uh, uh, giving us your insights. It's wonderful, it's, I mean, the, the, the gentleman you are, you are um, uh, refraining from criticizing Western Europe, of course, um, because like you so rightly said, you know, right or wrong, it's not so interesting. The analysis is more interesting. Um, as a Dutchman, I remember very vividly the moment of the uh, crawling of the, the collapsing of the, the Iron Curtain. And I remember um, going there in 1989, before the end of the 
before the, uh, the wall came down, just before it, and going to Wenceslas Square, where the Czechoslovak people were demonstrating to be liberated of the occupation of the Soviet system of the Soviet Union, which made a huge and lasting impression of me of these hundreds of thousands of Czech and Slovak people standing there and saying that they are the people uh, wanting to return to Europe. Um, I do blame, I think, after what I heard you saying tonight. Personally, I would think that the way we irresponsibly keep acting towards Central and Eastern Europe by telling them what to do, by sending buses of capitalists there and thinking that if you put on a little um, sign and saying that it's uh, the burrs, that it's the, 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 the capital markets were doing it, or that, that you just can change. Maurice, if you see how the other part of Europe has been paying the rent for, the second, the, for, the, for, the, for half of a century, the rent for the Second World War being occupied by the Soviets. Um, I would say that listening a little bit to Obzanske Forum, to Civic Platform, to Solidarnosc, to Bulgarians and others, Europeans who um, really know what it is to cooperate within a society, to have civic spirit, to have civic insights, which we have forgotten a long time ago because we think that capitalist values uh, are the same as liberal values. Um, then I do think that if we return to the question we've been posed for the last one, uh, the stingy approach, the sort of myopic approach, the nationalistic approach to the Western Balkans again, um, that we can't take our responsibility as a real power looking to the Chinese and the Americans and instead um, punishing the Albanians for the maybe not too uh, uh, well-going accession of the Bulgarians because we didn't put the right <laughs> questions is a bit myopic. And again, I would say the Western Europeans, as a Western European, need to take their responsibility instead of telling other Europeans what and how to do. Thank you very, very much for talking to us, Ivan Kastev. Thank you very, very much. I would recommend the book. The book is, uh, you can buy the book. The book is excellent. Uh, and we hope to see you. Uh, oh, thank you very soon. much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.